All right, well, here we are, May 9th, and uh, or is it the 10th? Anyway, it's sometime around there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful day in Yuma again, having a lovely spring day here, and we're going through the book of Ephesians, and uh, if yes. you were with us last week, we went through the, the third chapter, but there's a couple of things I want to go back and hit again. You know, there's there's so much in here, you know, you can't get it all. I mean, we could spend weeks just on one chapter and yeah. we don't want to, uh, we don't want to do that. But uh, there was just a couple of things I wanted to, uh, as I was studying and reading and reading some commentaries that just uh, kind of clicked with me, I wanted to, to go back and hit on. So let's read uh, verses uh, 12 through 14. This is Philippians chapter 3. And he says, this is the words of Paul, of course. He's writing this letter to the church at Philippi, and he's in prison at this time in Rome. And, and he says, not that I've already obtained all this. Uh, obtained what? Well, right before that, he's talking about, uh, it says, I want to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection, yes. participation in his yes. suffering, becoming like him in death. Yes. And he says, not that I've already obtained all this. As we talked about last time, if anybody could say they've obtained something, it's Paul. It's I mean, Paul. look at, first of all, he, he uh, up above in uh, verses, uh, where is it, four through six, he talks about all that he had obtained mm -hmm. in his uh, life as a Jew. That he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, that he was a uh, Hebrew of Hebrews, yeah. he was, you know, zealous and persecuting the church, and he had all these things that, he said, if I, anybody had any right to boast, it'd be me, mm -hmm. talking about before he got saved. Yeah. But on the other hand, if anybody had anything to boast about after they got saved, it would be Paul. Because, you know, he started all these churches. He wrote a good part of the New Testament. Of course, yeah. he didn't know that at the time. He didn't know he was writing the New Testament when he wrote these letters. He was just writing letters to encourage people. He didn't know he was writing scripture we're still going to be reading yeah. thousands of years later but all these things he's, he's done so many things and yet he says i haven't obtained not that i obtained uh, but i press on uh, to take hold of what christ jesus took hold of me for in other words i'm still working towards that i'm still working toward what god has, has called me to do and he says, I don't don't consider myself having to take hold of it yet. Now, as I was reading that, it almost, you know, well, later on in chapter 4, I think it's in verse 11, somewhere about there. Anyway, Paul talks about, I've learned to be content in, mm -hmm. in whatever situation I'm in, whatever circumstance. And almost, you read this and you think at first, well, he doesn't sound content here. He sounds like, oh, I'm, I'm still going, I'm still, I'm still reaching. Yeah. Well, I think there's a difference between being content and being satisfied. Paul was content mm. with, the, with what God had done with him. He was content with where he was. He was even content right now that you know, when he's writing yeah. his letter, the fact he's in prison. He's not griping and complaining. He's saying, you know, it's like he knows he's there because God's, got a purpose for him to be there yeah. but he's not satisfied uh, when we get satisfied with things it's kind of like ah, this is fine you know i don't need more <laughs> i don't want more uh, but we should never get satisfied with where we are in christ no. we can be content with it but as long as we're still alive it, our, our objective ought to be to be reaching forward to yeah. getting more to getting closer yeah. to getting better understanding of what god has for us of greater understanding of what god's purpose for this world is and his plan for this world and of course especially his plan and purpose for each one of us individually because he does has a plan he does have a plan for each one of us he has a purpose for each one of us and our goal ought to be to try and reach that purpose, to fulfill that purpose. And I believe that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. Uh, as long as he's saying, basically, as long as I'm still alive, 
I, I'm still working towards that. I'm still reaching forward. As long as I'm still alive, that means God still has a purpose for me. He hasn't fulfilled that purpose totally yet. And uh, he says, forgetting what's behind, straining forward, straining what's ahead. I press on. All these things he talks about. Uh, and it almost sounds like, and we again mentioned this last time, almost sounds like he's talking about works, but these works aren't to obtain his salvation. These works are because he is saved. God has gotten hold of him. He is the righteousness of God. He has been saved. But because of that, he's trying to work all these things into his life. As he said back in the previous chapters, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, that we don't miss out on what God has for us. And then one other thing that I, that I caught here that as I was reading this and doing some other studying, it says this one thing I do. What's the one thing he did? Forgetting what's not, behind, yeah. not being held back by that. Now, what he said when he says forgetting what's behind, not like, oh, it was totally wipe it out of our memory. <laughs> First of all, we can't do that. But, uh, you know, you can't forget your past failures or even your past successes. But what he's saying is not letting those hold you back, yeah. whether it's our successes or our failures. You know, sometimes we, we can... Uh, let our failures hold us back or you know the devil's good about reminding us all the mistakes we've made and then that can hold us back or our, our successes we can look back on our past glories our past achievements oh man that was I really achieved a great thing there and we just focus on that just settle down there but he says that I just put that behind me yeah. and I keep going forward keep reaching forward yeah. but as I read this scripture, and first uh, one thing I do, I was thinking, uh, well, I found this actually in a commentary, but it was uh, talking about other times when uh, the Bible talks about this one thing, this one thing I do. And uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus was talking to a rich, uh, a rich young man. And uh, you probably remember the story. He came to him and asked Jesus, what, uh, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus talked to him about the law. Of course, apparently this was a Jewish man. He said, oh, I've done all this. I've done everything that you yeah. told me, to, that, yeah. I mean, the law tells me to do. And, and, uh, and Jesus said, there's one thing one you thing. lack. <laughs> one thing that you lack. Oh, well, what is that? Well... Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Yeah. So what was the one thing he lacked? Some people would say poverty. You know, you can't be saved unless you're poor. You oh. know, you have to be, you have to be po poverty stricken for God to really care about you. Well, sometimes uh, people mis misconstrue the the parable of Lazarus and the, and the rich man. You know, going off when they both died and. The rich man wound up in a place of torment, and Lazarus, a poor man who sat at the rich man's gate begging for food, uh, he went off to be with Abraham. Some people get the idea, well, that means that all rich people go to a place of torment and poor people go to a, go to a good place, but Aww. that wasn't what it was at, at, at all. No. Uh, a lot of rich people that are very generous and, and trusting in God. But what did he lack? He lacked tr trust in the Lord. His, his trust was in, was in his money, is in his riches. Mm, uh, it's interesting to note, you can read all through the Bible and it's not recorded one other time where God ever told anybody, give away everything you got and give it to the poor. In fact, just shortly after that story, mm -hmm. you read the story of another man called Zacchaeus. And he was also a rich man. Yeah. But there was a difference in it. This, this man, this rich man that Jesus was talking to, he apparently earned his money honestly because he said he followed the law, did everything mm -hmm. the law told mm -hmm. him to do. Sounded like he was an honest man. Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Yeah. And there was only one way in those days that tax collectors could get rich, and that was by cheating people. Yeah. 
And Jesus never said a word to him about money. Here's, here's a rich man, another rich man. He doesn't tell him, go and sell all you have. But as soon as Jesus calls him and says, I'm going to have dinner at your, your house today, conviction comes on him. And immediately he says, you know, anybody I've cheated, I'm going to pay him back several times. And I'm going to give away half of all I have to the poor. Now, why didn't Jesus say, well, that's not good enough, Lazarus. You, I mean, uh, Zacchaeus, you have to give away everything. Give it all away. He doesn't say that. No. He doesn't tell him anything about giving. Uh, it's just where we're at. Jesus knows where we're at. And the thing this rich man lacked, the one thing that he needed to do was put his trust in the Lord, not in his money, mm -hmm. not in his riches. And it's so easy to get caught up in, in our riches and, and, and trusting things of this world. Maybe it's not riches, but other things in this world that we put our, our trust in. You know, I, I put my trust in my job. You know, I got a good job. And if we lose it, if something happens to the economy or for some reason they start laying off people, why, then if our trust in that, we, we're devastated. We don't know what to do. But if our trust is in God, there's no, no problem, That's you know. Right. It may be a struggle for a while. I'm not saying it won't be struggles, but there's one thing that we need to do: put our focus on Jesus. Yeah. Then in Luke ten forty two, Jesus said to Martha, "If you remember the story about Martha and Mary, when Jesus went to their house and yeah. and um, Martha was in the kitchen cleaning and baking and." <laughs> fixing fried chicken and whatever <laughs> whatever else she was doing. And finally, and Mary's in there sitting and listen, sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his yeah. teaching. And, and Martha finally gets fed up and goes in and says, Lord, don't you, don't you care? I'm working my fingers to the bone and Mary just sitting here doing nothing. Won't you tell her to get off her backside and come help me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha. You gotta love it. <laughs> So you're busy about many things, but one thing, one thing is needed. Yeah. And what's that thing that's needed? The it's word. not more busyness, more help, more uh, busyness, uh, more carrying on, but it's... Activity. Yeah. yeah, more activity. It's not that, but it's more sitting at the feet of Jesus. Yeah, just spending time with spending him. Spending time with him, listening mm -hmm. to him. And, and we do that through studying the Word, but also yeah. through prayer, just yes. time meditating on the Word, meditating on, yes. on the goodness of God. He said, there's one thing is needed. As Paul said, there's one thing I do. Jesus said, there's one thing is needed. And so that's what we need. We need to set before the Lord and then spend time with Him. Uh, another example in uh, John chapter 9, this is a story about the man that was born blind from, from birth. Or, mm -hmm. Well, if he's born blind, it was from birth. So anyway, he was born <laughs> blind. <laughs> and Jesus came along and healed him. And then the Pharisees got upset and wanted to know, you know, how did you get healed? And, and he told them, you know, well, this man uh, laid hands on me. Well, who? And then he yeah. finally found out with Jesus. And he told them who it was. And they they. They started arguing with this man's a sinner, you know. We we he can't heal people. How'd you get healed? And he said, <laughs> You know, where this man's a sinner, not one thing I know. One thing I know. One thing I know. And what is that? That Jesus touched him and Jesus healed him. That's right. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to argue against something like that. When you know when Jesus has touched you and Jesus has made a difference in your life. I know people can come along and argue with it. Well, that was just uh, just coincidence, you know, that you started doing better when you put your trust in Jesus or that, you know, things went better for you when you put your trust in Jesus. No, it's not. That's not just coincidence. There's one thing I know. My life was a whole lot better. My life was changed when I put my trust in Jesus. This is the one thing I know. And then um, one other thing, or one other scripture here. And let me, let me read this one out. This is a Psalms 27, verse 4. 
Again, talking about the one thing. <clears throat> 27, verse 4. Okay, so 27. Yeah, well, I think I, I'm in Proverbs. I was oh. going to say, that don't look right. I got to get the right book here. That's Proverbs, not Psalms. I need Psalms. <clears throat> Makes you a bit nervous when you find the thirst. Think you found the scripture and <laughs> it doesn't say what you think it says. <laughs> Here we go. This is it. Psalms 27. One thing. This is verse 4, chapter 27, or uh -huh. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask from the Lord. This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he'll keep me safe in his dwelling. He'll hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. He said, there's one thing I ask of God. What's that one thing? There's one thing, as only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The house of the Lord, of course, in this, uh, the Old Testament, that basically talking about the, the um, the temple but i think as we bring that up to today i think it's just being in the presence of god and how do we get into the presence of god through accepting jesus as our lord and savior yeah. in hebrews it talks about the fact that we can come boldly into the throne room because of what jesus has done on had done on the cross because of his sacrifice that we can come boldly into the throne room yeah. and so <clears throat> we should be constantly aware of the fact that, that we are in God's presence. God is with us. He's here. We are his, our bodies are the temple of the Holy yes. Spirit. And he is with us. And so this one thing that we can ask, and this is what we need to seek, that we spend our time with him, that we, he becomes the number one thing in our life. And, and all, <clears throat> uh, all our life should be sent spent seeking after him mm -hmm. there's because, a lot of benefits being in the presence of the lord oh there it is mean. well in psalms 103 it tells us yes not to forget all the benefits yeah well, let's look at that psalm 103 while we're talking about that mm -hmm. what are the benefits i know one of them is healing yeah well let's turn back there psalms 103 he says, forget not all my benefits. Yes. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inner being. Praise his holy name. Praise yes. the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Yeah. You know, when people, uh, people go to apply for a job, one thing they often want to know is, what's the benefits? Yes. Of course, they want to know the salary. What do I get paid? But what are the other benefits, you know? How much vacation time do I get? Do I get medical insurance? Do I get um, sick leave? Do I get uh, whatever? You know, those those things are important too. Yeah. You know, of course, your salary is important, but these other things are are vital or important parts of your of your benefits too. But what are the benefits? He says not to forget them. Uh, you know, we don't seek God just for his benefits, but on the other hand, he says we shouldn't forget him. He says, first of all, this is in chapter or verse 3 of Psalms 103, who forgives all of your sins. Yes. What a benefit. I mean, you don't have to pay the consequences for all your sins. He's forgiven all your sins. That's right. That's what Jesus went to the cross for. He paid the price for every one of our sins. You, they're, they're gone. Number two, yeah, number two, yeah. still in verse three, he heals all your diseases. Mm -hmm. Now, I know sometimes people say, well, I prayed and God didn't heal me. Well, eventually God does heal us all. Yes, you know, even if it may be when we go to heaven, we're going to get healed. But I believe he heals many of us That's even right. here on earth. And, and he uses doctors, too. Well, that's true. He uses doctors. Medication. The, yeah. the benefits that we have today for modern medicine, that, mm -hmm. uh, not just due to men's 
ingenuity or men's intelligence, but there are things that God has revealed. That's right. And uh, so he heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit? I tell you, my life one time was in the pit. I mean, I felt like I was you living in a pit. Like. But, yeah, I know what the pit feels like, and it ain't fun. But he redeemed my life from that. He took me out of that pit, brought me up out of that. He crowns us with love and compassion. God pours out his love and compassion on us. Because we deserve it? No, far from it. We don't deserve his love and compassion. He just pours it out upon us. Because he's a compassionate God. He's a loving God. Yes. In fact, John says that God is love. Yes. He doesn't just have love. He is love. He's a love machine, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> he says, who satisfies your desires with good things. good things. He knows how to give us good things. Yes. You know, the Bible talks about uh, the fact that you know, when we ask God, say, ask God for a fish, he doesn't give us a, a serpent or a stone. Yeah, and you ask for bread, he doesn't give us a, a stone. I forget exactly how it works. But in other words, he doesn't give us uh, what we don't ask for. No. He gives us what we ask for. And he says, if you, being evil, of course, that's talking about being evil com in comparison with God. If you fathers, being evil in comparison with me, if you wouldn't do that to your own kids, how much less would I do that? How much less would I, you know, give you a stone for bread or a scorpion for a, for a fish or a serpent for a fish, whatever it is? He says, I'll satisfy your desires with good things. And then the last part here, and this is verse, uh, still verse 5, he says, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. That's a verse I cling to. Yeah, like My that. youth is being <laughs> renewed like the eagles. You know, may not look like it on the outside, but on the inside, he's he's restoring his youthful, uh, my youthful mind, a youthful enthusiasm. My my body may not be renewed yet, but but that's going to be renewed someday too. You know, that's, that's the final thing that's going to happen. He renews our spirit day by day. The inward man, uh, even though the outward man is perishing day by day, the inward man is being yes. renewed day by day. The yes. outward man is going to get renewed when Jesus comes back again and we all get resurrection bodies just like Jesus yes. has. Psalm 103 is really worth your time to you read know, through it, a, underline, and... and even mark on your Bibles, all the benefits. It's great. Yeah. That psalm is great. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a little off from what we're talking about, but not really because it's the that's the one thing we do. <laughs> one thing we do is, as Paul said, one thing I do, one thing we do. We don't forget the benefits and we yeah. strive forward toward walking right. in those benefits, walking in, in all those things. You know, God is freely given us righteousness, but we have to learn to walk in that righteousness. It just Righteousness comes when we accept what Jesus did on the cross. Scripture, and I know I've said this many times, but 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he that knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So it's just an exchange that Jesus made. All we have to do is accept that exchange and we become the righteousness of God. But, we have to learn to walk in that righteousness. Yeah, forget the past. Yeah, just like forget all the stuff in the past. Forget the all the all the good you. stuff. Paul, uh, as he talked about all these good things that he had done as a, as a Jew, uh, he had reached a high peak in the in the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. He was a Pharisee, which was quite uh, a high position. And he said, as far as zeal, uh, man, I was. I was so zealous for the for the Jewish religion that I was out killing the Christians because as far as he was concerned, as far as most of the Jews were concerned, this, this thing about Jesus being the Messiah was, was all heresy. It was all blasphemy. And Jesus saying that he was equal with God, that he was, you know, God's son, all these things. Those were blasphemous. And so 
the Jews were uh, fighting against that. Well, nobody was fighting against it harder than, than uh, Paul. He was full of zeal for that. Uh, but when he met Jesus face to face, mm -hmm. then he forgot about all that as far as counting on that being worth anything. He said, one place he said, I just count all that as, as garbage. Yeah. Uh, I think one translation even says manure. It says it's, it's just nothing. It doesn't uh, mean anything to me. And then verse 15, he says, we who are mature should take such a view of things. What, what view is he talking about? Well, he's just talking about what he just said, forgetting yeah. what's behind, straining what's, toward, what's new. And so maturity doesn't depend on how much you know, how uh, smart you are, how good you are at praying, how many sermons you've preached, how many people you've led to the Lord. Maturity is having the same view as Paul. I haven't attained anything yet. I'm just, I'm just reaching toward that. I want to, I want to know Him more. I want to know Him better. I want to be closer to Him. That's, that's maturity. Knowing that in this life we're never going to get to a place where yeah. we can just sit back and, oh, I got it made. You know, I'm, I've reached a pinnacle. I'm on the top of the world, and I don't need to learn anymore. No, there's always more to learn. There's always more to do. And not trying to, how do I want to put it, not trying to put condemnation that, oh, you're not working hard enough. You need to do more. No, it just means that we need to keep working toward it. We need to keep striving toward that the mark, the prize, uh, which God has called us for. The prize is just accomplishing what Jesus has called us to do. Again, he's called us for a purpose. He's put us on this earth to serve a purpose. And uh, we just need to keep working toward that. Amen. The last part of this third chapter, our citizenship is in heaven. We're citizens of heaven now. You may be citizens of the United States or, you know, you may be watching from another country. You may be citizens of some other country, but you have a dual citizenship. You're also a citizen of, a citizen of heaven. As yeah. Heaven is not a place, it's a kingdom. It's a kingdom of, of mm -hmm. God. And it's not a, it's not a piece of land. You know, God in the Old Testament, <clears throat> he gave the Israelites a kingdom. He gave them a piece of land. But today... The land that we're seeking is 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 a not a not a physical land, but it's a spiritual land. Yes. It's the kingdom of heaven, yes. and we're citizens of that. And what we're waiting for, it says, we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So the last thing is going to happen is when Jesus comes back, we're going to be glorified just like him. We're going to receive resurrection bodies. Yay. They're going to say they'll be just like his glorious body. And I tell you, that's going to be something. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's something. And, and we're not going to be, according to my understanding of Scripture, we're not going to be snatched up to live somewhere up in the sky. We're being brought back, in, as Revelation says, to a new earth. God's going to create a new heaven and new earth. And we're going to reside here on this earth. It's going to be restored to the way it was originally. And we're going to be restored in, with our resurrected bodies. And so we're, heaven is not, like say, someplace off up in the sky. But it's actually heaven's within us. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within and the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are synonymous. They're the same kingdoms. And that, that kingdom starts inside of us. And it starts the minute we get saved, the minute we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become citizens. Yes. Just like somebody comes to this country and they go through all the things that they have to go through and they stand before uh, the magistrate or whoever and take that pledge of 
uh, of loyalty to this nation, at that moment they become a citizen. Now, they may not know a lot. I mean, they had to have learned some things about the history of this country to become a citizen, but um, they don't know everything. They may not even speak very good English. They may not know a lot of things about this country, but they're citizens. Mm -hmm. And to be a good citizen, they should keep learning, keep learning more about this country. What makes this country work? What makes, you know, what's the culture of this country? How do we uh, live properly in this country? Well, once you become a citizen of heaven, it's not like, oh, I got it made. I'm a citizen of heaven now. <laughs> no, we need to learn how that, how that, how that kingdom works. works. Yeah. yeah, how it works, how we can be affected. Learn the language of that kingdom. And, and all that comes through spending time in the Word, spending time with the Lord. And it's, it's a never-ending thing. We spend the rest of our life, do, at least we should, spend the rest of our life doing that. So, all right. Well, <clears throat> we were going to get into chapter 4, but the first part, there's, there's some good stuff in there that I don't want to rush through. And uh, uh, where it talks about don't, not being anxious about anything. Um, uh, that in itself is, uh, <laughs> you can spend forever on that. You can spend a long time talking about that. Don't be anxious or don't worry about yeah. anything. Yeah. Think, worry. Whoa, well, how in the world do we do that? Well, we're going to talk about that next week. Okay. How you can live a worry-free, anxiety-free life. That'd be uh, good. It, Take some work, but it's well worth it. Everything God promises, everything God tells us to do, it's well worth it's it. Worth it. It's worth every every minute we spend doing it. Sometimes we got the feeling, well, that's just too much work. Well, anything worthwhile is worth working for. And so being free of anxiety and worry is definitely something to be worked for. Yes, so definitely. So anyway, let's end right there. Let me pray, and we'll just uh, we'll take up chapter four okay. next week. And if I don't find something else in chapter three, and decide to go back again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Father, I thank you for this yes. precious word, Father. I thank you, Lord, that you. that you preserve these things, Lord, uh, for us, for our information, for our edification, for our revelation, Father. These words that Paul is is uh, written to these, this church at Philippi, Father. And they're no different than we are, Father. They were human beings. They had their faults and their weaknesses, uh, but they were loved just like we are, Father. And so I thank you, Lord, that as we read these letters, even though Paul wrote it to this church at Philippi, Lord, they apply just as much to us today as they did to those people couple thousand years ago, Lord. These, that word applies to us. So help us, Lord, to apply it to our life, to be, Lord, the, the, the men and women of God that you called us to be, Lord, to walk in all the things, all those benefits that you've given us, Father, all the blessings that you've given us, Lord, and help us to walk in that righteousness, that holiness that, that has been imparted by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But it's something we have to learn to walk in, Father. So help us, Lord, to continue to grow and, and uh, spend more time with you, Father, and become the, the people that you want us to be, Father, to fulfill your plans and your purposes in our life, Father. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We will see you next week and hopefully get into chapter four. Yeah. Learn how to live a worry-free life. I like that. <laughs> <laughs>